Hey team, Ben Lawless here. Uh, I would like to walk you through some of my thoughts on learning progressions today. Um, this presentation is massive and I'll probably skip through big bits of it. So if you want to see this PowerPoint as a PDF in full, go to my site to the progressions page. It's linked there at the top. And the password, as always, is my last name. Uh, there's also a big text right up there as well. So let's get into it. I'd just like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri as the traditional owners of the land that I am doing this presentation on and I acknowledge their land was never ceded. So we're going to look at a couple of different aspects of terminology, why you should consider progressions, if you're going to consider them, what kinds of things to consider, there's a big list of questions to think about in depth before you even start thinking about progressions I reckon. Um, why, you know, the big obvious question is why can't we use the curriculum as a progression? We'll look into that. Some ways to make them, uh, a sp very specific way to make them, which I was taught at Melbourne Uni. Lots of examples. Um, and another specific example of making progressions. And then a few, we'll look at a few criticisms right at the end. None of which are fatal, I don't think. So, current achievement, when we're looking at learning progressions, we'll distinguish between current achievement and progress, and current achievement is the Vygotsky and idea of the zone of actual development. That's what students can do by themselves, as opposed to the zone of proximal development, which is where teaching is most effective. Uh, I think that's fairly obvious. I uh, want to make a distinction here between norm referencing and criterion referencing, right? So most curriculums and stuff that you see is based on norm referencing. Uh, what I specialize in developmental rubrics is criterion reference. It's reference to what students can do, not how they compare with others. And there are two types of progressions. Hypothesize, that's the ones that we make up. And empirical, that's based big things that are based on massive amounts of student data. The main point here is that empirical progressions are way better. So if you're making a hypothesized progression, which is what you do when you just try and create one with fellow teachers, if you can validate it using data, and we'll look at a few different ways of doing that, that will make it way better. So why? A whole heap of things. I'm not going to mention all these uh, in detail. So it's a form of curriculum mapping. Okay. Um, there's not been specific double-blind experiments done on progression use versus non-progression use. A lot of the benefits of progressions come in the way that teachers act differently. Um, and if you want to see an example of a really, really successful one, one of the, probably the most successful project from the Assessment Research Centre at Melbourne Uni is the Ables and Swans thing, which is where they develop learning progressions for students with uh, additional needs. Uh, another thing is that progressions help teachers to think about student progress rather than just current achievement, which seems to be a massive obsession uh, in Australia and kind of a bit more around the world. And we've got another than Ron Richard's fantastic quote when it comes to grading. I'll just leave that hanging out there. Um, I'm quite anti-grade, uh, you know, there's nothing wrong with um, assessment that might generate grades, but focusing just on the grades is not particularly motivating to students. I think it's very demotivating, to, demotivating to students at the higher and lower end of the ability spectrum. Uh, and there's huge benefits. Uh, learning progressions is part of the developmental model of thinking, and so it gains from some of the same benefits as those two, like all that kind of good stuff. Um, in preparation for this, I went to speak to some of my colleagues at Melbourne Uni and asked to find for some of the research basis for why we should use learning progressions. Um, I linked to this in the reference section at the end, but just to summarise, there's a guy called Alonzo, him and a few researchers did a paper, and what they found is that, yes, learning progressions simplify. That's part of, that's a feature of learning progressions. It's not a mistake. It's a feature, not a bug. Um, 
and this can massively help. So what they found is the biggest benefit to learning progressions is on what teachers do. So better discussions between teachers, better planning, better assessment, better knowledge of what they're doing. Um, but there's also better self and peer assessment. So you think that bottleneck of the teacher has to mark everything. Well, if you've got a learning progression that lays out um, what it looks like to get better in something, then students can start to work their own way through those progressions. Uh, one thing that Lonza did find, though, is that they found it quite difficult to assign student learn. Once you come up with the learning progression levels, all of the stuff in the learning progression is good, but being able to very accurately pinpoint a student's level using assessment can be quite difficult. That's something that um, other criticisms have found as well, is that using the learning progression for assessment directly uh, is not the easiest. And just randomly, I just thought I'd put this slide in here because here's some student, this is student feedback from rubrics that we use at some schools I've taught at. Um, students love this kind of stuff because it demystifies what it looks like to get better. So I'm going to show you some slides of a whole heap of considerations. Now I'm not going to spend a lot of time on each of these. Read them. Uh, I think that you need to consider every single one of these questions before you even start thinking about whether you're going to bother making learning progressions or using them. The main one I'd say is what's it for? You know, learning progressions can be written in all different ways and you need to make sure that you've got the purpose of what it's for. Is it student facing, teacher facing, a parent's going to see it, is it going to drive planning, assessment? Uh, what, how closely aligned is it going to be to the curriculum that you've got? As you'll see in the Australian context, you can't really use the curriculum straight and translate it straight into a learning progression. There's a certain amount of translation required. One thing I would focus on though, uh, and I think this is something that's a criticism of the developmental system in general, which I don't think holds, if you know what you're doing, which this one here, you almost always see progressions about skills and not knowledge. You can write progressions about the use of knowledge, and I think that would be a great thing to do, because knowledge is very important. This is just, uh, you know, uh, when you get to the process of developing learning progressions, how you're going to do it, who's going to do it. And then the all important thing, you know, you can have the greatest learning progressions in the world, but if it's not well implemented, it's going to be a disaster. Implementation is really the enabling feature here. And then whoop, what's it going to look like? That last slide was just about, is it going to go up, down, left, right? <coughs> I used to have progressions going from bottom to top, but I now actually think it makes more sense than going left to right because you can easily keep adding more on when it's left to right rather than vertical. But anyway, um, this slide's about another another question is, you know, are you going to underpin your progression with a learning taxonomy? Some people are... You know, wedded to solo, some to blooms. The Victorian and Australian curriculums are kind of written with blooms. You know, I fed this through some AI, and even according to the people who made this stuff, they don't think there's any conflict between solo and blooms. So I personally don't believe that learning taxonomies are real. I think that they're just a guide to practice. And so if they're helpful to describe student performance, great. If they're not, don't bother. Use them as a, as a starting point, I would say. I don't think we need to be religiously devoted to any one of these things. So just really quickly, this is the process that I would recommend that schools use if they're writing them themselves. Define the construct, so decide what the subject is going to be. Some of that will come from your school, from the published curriculum. Some will come from school priorities that you might have. Um, split that big construct. So Construct definition is really important, something Tim William talks about a lot. Once you define the construct really well, then it'll be much easier to agree about how to assess it. A lot of arguments about assessment are actually arguments about the construct, i.e. the underlying thing that you want students to get better at. Is it literacy? Is it, you know, graphical representation of maths and science or whatever? Once you've done the construct definition, you split that up into separate skills. 
and you write criteria for those skills, then you level them doing a pairwise comparison. You'll see some graphical representations of this later, and then you write level statements. And then you can assess, you can describe student performance just using the level statements or whatever. So that's a very simple overview of pretty much the rest of this slideshow. I'm just going to quickly delve into why you can't use the curriculum as published and turn it into a progression. Um, a random quote from someone at the department who basically admitted that you can't do it, but anyway. Uh, here I did a really quick uh, analysis of the History 7 to 10 curriculum in Victoria. Um, red is 7 to 8, blue is 9 to 10, purple is exactly the same for the entire four year levels, and if you look at that, it should go from red to blue, but there's no rhyme or reason. So the criteria and the achievements, the achievement standards are not developmental. You can make them developmental. Um, I took the exact same criteria and just reordered them, so it's certainly possible, and you can give them level names. You could even give them progression point names. The problem with giving them those numbers is that the majority of these students will never get past like 8.5 or 9. And that's not typical in schools. In schools, it's typical for about 70% of people at least to be given the, the progression point that's appropriate for at the end of the year. But anyway, not my problem. But then you could even have level statements. So in this one here, instead of the 7, 8, 9, 10, you've got a little statement saying what students can do at that level. So um, the benefit of assessing, of describing student performance using level statements is it's a meaningful statement rather than a number, which is impossible to interpret. Uh, another hilarious thing is that, check this out, this is from Geography, I think, and I'm sure there's heaps more. I only looked at a small bit of the curriculum. There are things in the achievement standards that are not even in the content descriptors. Now, if you know much about the Victorian curriculum, you'll know how insane that is. There's, the achievement standards are supposed to be a summary of the content descriptors but they've just added random new stuff in, so can't use that. Another issue is that if you're trying to turn them into more levels, is that you've only got one descriptor for 7, 8, and one for 9, 10, so that's only two statements that's supposed to describe four years' worth of learning, so there's nowhere near enough information in there anyway. Um, this is an achievement standard, so this is just achievement standard text. The problem here is that it describes what students should learn in that year, not how well they should do it, which possibly is a feature of the achievement standards, but another reason why they can't easily be turned into learning progressions. Another thing is that there's not even a um, consistent number of achievement standards in different subjects. So most have two, English has got four, math has got five. I don't know what you're supposed to do about that. Now, progression points, I'm not going to go on about this too much because I don't love them, but basically they're not even officially supported despite most department schools using them. They're inconsistent between schools. I think progression points really just tell you how you're doing roughly compared to other students at that school. Very hard to connect to learning progressions. So there's lots of different methods of developing progressions. Um, here are a few. Uh, you can do them, there's a couple of different direction, ways that you could do it. You could start with your const. I think ideally starting with a construct would be best, and then split it up into skills, uh, and then have your rubric criteria and progression. Or you could start with existing rubrics, do a pairwise comparison on those criteria, and then define the construct that way. I think that if you're doing it from scratch, defining the construct first is by far the best move. So, saying that in a different way, it kind of looks a bit like that. So, contract definition. I think I've talked about this in a little bit already, but basically, contract definition is about defining what the subject is. Um, once you've defined... So, for example, you know, you often hear people going, oh, you can't use multiple choice skills to assess that subject. Well, that depends if you think that some of that subject is rote memorization of facts, which... You know, all learning involves memory, so I don't see why it wouldn't be. 
I'm going to show you a little six step process about how you can produce a progression by starting with a rubric. So remember I told you the two ways you could start with the construct, split it up into skills, write criteria, level that, or you could start with a rubric, then do pairwise, then do level statements. The reason why a lot of schools do it this way around is because they already have a heap of existing rubrics which they don't want to chuck out. So these would be the steps. The hard step is four and five. Anyway, even if you only get the, the great benefit about this journey is that even if you only get to step one, that's going to be a big improvement. So step one is changing your rubrics from badly written to using developmental language, which there's heaps of other material around from me about that. Then doing a pairwise comparison. So that's comparing the relative difficulty of the different criteria so in this example how high up the rubric it is the harder it is and we are saying that things at the same level are roughly the same difficulty now remember that's what's called theoretical or hypothesized because that's just what teachers think if we can validate that with data it massively improves the quality of our progressions in terms of writing level statements this is one of the most difficult things i assess students on this at the postgrad level at uni and it's probably the thing that they struggle with the most. I'm not going to go into too much detail. A colleague of mine, uh, shout out to Pam Robertson, wrote this text which I've unashamedly just stolen and pasted there for you. So if you're writing level statements, read that. Basically, a level statement should not be just a summary of all the criteria at that level. It should be uh, a description of the mental model under which students operate when they are at that level. So. Here's that same rubric with pairwise comparison with now level statements. If you're using that level statements to assess students across years, remember that you need to have enough levels so that you can put them at a different level at least once a year. Otherwise, parents will be like, hey, they haven't learned anything this year. Now, turning this theoretical progression into an empirical progression, uh, there's material on other bits of my site about how to do this. I'm not going to go into too much detail here, but you can assess students using these criteria and the more often they are awarded, the easier they are, right? And then you can use those numbers that you get to reorder your uh, pairwise comparison. So if you do a Gutman analysis, which is looking at the frequency, like comparing student ability and criteria difficulty, um, then you can improve the leveling using student data. How do you turn that into a multi-year one? There's three different ways you can do it. You can do it purely hypothesizing it, hypothesize the whole thing, you can have a mixture, or you can do it purely with data. For most, one of the biggest difficulties of trying to empirically validate or improve progressions with data is that you need to have a wad of data and be skilled in analyzing it. It's not that hard. I've done it in a school context just with Microsoft Excel. So if you want to know more about that, it's vaguely complex. So I'm not going to go into it right now. One point to note though, if you have say four different rubrics based, uh, so four different within year, single year progressions, you can't stack them obviously, right? Because the lowest level for each individual year is likely to stay the same. Remember that the diversity of a student ability grows massively as students age. So your weakest year sevens, the level that they're at, is going to be fairly similar to what they're at by the end of year 10. So you can't put them on something way higher than that. So there's a combination that you could do where you have its empirical, sorry, its hypothetical, empirical within the year but hypothesized between the year and an example of us doing that we did it by so if you have a look at that each color is a different year level and we've cut it out and leveled it that way or you, you can do a purely empirical so something like that but where you assess the entirety of your school say 7 to 10 on the same massive uh, progression or set of criteria and then you level it that way and then I mean this is my fantasy land you can on your report report against the levels and then what you call the levels steps whatever I don't know the problem is that most 
naming conventions have already been taken up. So how you tackle that one? You know, you, you got these steps. You could also they could be called levels. You could have a report that looked like that if you wanted to include. Um, uh, if you wanted to link it to level statements. Another example of a rubric to progression is something like this. So on the left, you've got the criteria, which are, have been leveled using a pairwise comparison. And then you've got your level statements there, one, two, three, and four. And then in this example, the student can do everything in gray and they're starting to do the stuff in green. So their ZAD is level one, two, and three. There's an approximal development where teaching instructions most effective for that kid for that learner is at level four so now we're going to look at a whole heap of examples and I'm going to quickly talk about uh, in terms of those considerations we looked at earlier uh, what answers these various people who made these progressions had to those so the big one that's uh, been big recently in Victoria is the Preston High system so they were lucky in that they started a school before there were any students there, so they were able to design an entire system. So they kind of rewrote the Victorian curriculum, translated it into solo. Uh, this is great stuff. I have no criticisms of it. I don't know that there's enough of a difference, but you know some of the stuff they said was quite convincing. They There's a significant rewrite here. They actually... Not only have they combined some skills, they've split another few things out there. So like communication, scientific language, that's not written exactly like that in the curriculum. But um, they're a fantastic bunch of teachers using their own professional judgment have interpreted the curriculum to turn it into something more like a progression. And there's just a list of dot points summarizing some of their responses to those considerations. Um, that's a science one. That is a history one. Same sort of principles. The next one here is something that me and a colleague of mine have been working on for the last year and a bit. Uh, myself and Bianca Wood. It's going to come out soon called the Lawless and Wood Literacy Criteria. We took, we took the existing attempt to do a literacy progression by VCAR and then have expanded it massively. And we've gone down the line of like really, really, really finely grained. So when we talk about granularity, it's like how detailed are the criteria? How many of them are there? How many there are is just, there's no set answer. There's no correct answer as to how many it should be. It's just, what are you using it for? We are writing a massive list of insanely finely grained criteria. And we're going to share that open source, I think, with the idea that teachers can use that for assessment tools or for helping writing their own progressions or whatever. Um, it's been great. Uh, here's another random one. I'm kind of putting that up there as an example of not a good one because someone shared this with me. I can't remember the name of the school. It's tricky because you've got, you know, partial versus whole. That makes it difficult to mark. You know, there's kind of a second layer of interpretation there. Um, and they've got their own school-based codes. I like the idea of a school-based code. Anyway, and it's unclear how that was derived from the progression. This one here is something that I did myself. This is something that I'm using at my school. I wanted to have uh, a list of... Um, I wanted to have a list of criteria that I could use to sort of help me with writing learning activities for different year levels. This is not based on, so the, the skills come from the curriculum. I've split some of them up a bit more than they would be otherwise, but the statements at each year level are typical performance in that skill for students at my school. So a year seven at my school by the end by the end of the year is able to sequence events on a timeline, but they're not actually, most kids can't fully conform to all timeline conventions until the end of year eight. So that can be quite, I found that quite helpful with planning, uh, learning activities and writing uh, different, writing self-paced, self-regulated learning booklets, which is my, my jam at the moment. So that's a skill-based one. Here's a content-based one. You can write content and, 
I've actually only written one row for the entire subject of Ancient Australia, but I could actually be even more finely grained than that and take every content descriptor and write some criteria for each of them. Um, here's a great achievement that I had with VCAA. Myself and Jerry Martin rewrote the existing history performance descriptors from years 11 and 12 according to developmental principles. Um, you'll notice even there we've split up some of their skills. So this was continuity and change, but a separate one, continuity and change. Uh, and sources, using sources and events, we notice that there's a difference between the content of the source and the reliability, usefulness, etc. of the source. Uh, we think that's fantastic. Uh, that provides advice for planning, but also for writing cats. And we found when we tested that with Year 12 history teachers, they loved it and thought it was a huge improvement on what was happening before. So in terms of that being a progression, you could go, you know, there's a level, there's a level, and so on. So each column could be a uh, further level. This is one that I did, uh, that I used to work on. I've kind of stopped working on that now that I've got AI to do this kind of stuff way quicker and better. This is something I worked on over about five years um, where I just pieced together de developmental assessment rubrics from the school I was teaching at and then writing targeted uh, activities to get you to that level. They're all available for free on my site. Uh, on, yeah. uh, an example of some level statements is a whole heap. Um, you see, you know, when you even just looking at those level statements, you could actually read those statements and then write criteria based on them. So anyway, and this could be a very rough and ready way to uh, assess students from years seven to 10. You could look at some of their work. If it was a complex performance and go, yep, that's a level G student. Yep, that's a level J. What kind of stuff should I expose that kid to? Level K stuff, whatever the level or level two, two levels above it there is. This one here is from the Assessment Research Center and is therefore really awesome. I actually can't, this is from 14 years ago. I can't remember how they did it, but because it's ARC, I guarantee that it was, this would have been empirically validated. Mostly that stuff you've looked at is uh, hypothesized or theoretical. This will be empirically validated. And I can't stress that enough. It's really awesome to try and empirically validate your progressions. And that's a really, really great one. So have a look at that. That describes improvement in reading. This one here is one that I did um, at a school. This was looking at themes and we took existing rubrics, rewrote them a little bit to improve them, did a petwise comparison for all of the four different assessments. There's four assessments there in different colors and then we wrote level statements. That's hugely, this, and one of the massive things that teachers using this have gotten out of it is consistency of understanding and consistency of approach across teachers. This one here was just a random little one that I generated using AI. Um, there's the civics and citizenship uh, material. I'm a humanities teacher, so this is why a lot of this stuff on this stuff. Um, there's not much out there, so I just got annual, and in the content descriptors for civic and citizenship, it's just one statement, but using random different Bloom's verbs. So I just fed the curriculum statement on the left-hand side and said, make a criteria starting with each of these different Bloom's verbs. So this is not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but it's certainly a lot better than just the curriculum statements by themselves in terms of trying to come up with activities at different levels and, you know, planning, separating out your own teaching and thinking, what do I teach next to students of various abilities? Uh, this is just one that I found. It's from University of Adelaide. It's interesting because it's funny how much stuff that should be amazing because it comes from a university is like, not that great. This entire thing, as far as I can tell, is just based on the level of independence of the student. Feel free to have a look at that and confirm whether I was right or not. Another one that I got AI to generate, I'm not going to spend much time on this because it's not that great, but the curriculum statement on the left, I just got chat to separate it into four different levels. 
it hasn't improved the writing. It's not written developmentally. It still contains ambiguous language. However, I think that having that curriculum statement split into four levels is more useful than just one. Now, I want to show you, say you've got a progression or you've got this big thing. How do you turn that into an assessment task rubric? Here's the example of the one that we did with VCE history performance descriptors. You've got your complete thing. Uh, now you're going to separate it into just the skills that you use on that cat. So you've just got those ones, for example. Then you take out the criteria that are not that students in your class don't typically do. So they might be too easy or too hard. It looks like that. Then squash that together to the left. Then you contextualize it using statements from the actual essay or whatever. And then, and this is a grading decision which I won't go into, but this is the advice that VCAR provided because they require you to give a mark. Once you mark a student's essay, you could assign ranges of marks to various criteria. No problem doing that. Here's another example of the one that I showed you earlier. So here's the one that I wrote. Um, that's a skill progression, mind you. Here's the knowledge progression. Now I'm going to turn that into an assessment task rubric for a specific assessment task. So I'm going to take these ones. I'm, say I'm doing a year seven history timeline assessment task. Yep, so I'm going to take all of those ones. But it's about ancient Greece. So I'm also going to add in um, those that content knowledge strand there. I realize that that's stuffed up at the bottom. Ancient Greece should be one further to the left. So now there's the two combined. Then I'm going to take away all of the codes and stuff, and I've got that. And then, so I've got my year level five, six, seven, eight, nine, but I don't want students to see that. So I could say something, change the, the uh, titles to working towards at level or stretch. Personally, I am not a huge fan of labeling those levels anyway. I think that, and I don't have any research to back it up, it's just a hunch, it's just anecdotal evidence that when students see these um, descriptions of what those levels should be, they can be demotivated at either level. Some students might be like, oh, I only want to be at level, so whatever. Whereas if I just show that to them without any of that, then it, and then and the message I send is everybody needs to get as far across this thing as they possibly can. I'm not I'm not interested in the level, you know. We don't have the same expectations for all students in our class, so so that's what that would look like. Okay, some criticisms. And they are real. And there's a much more detailed discussion of these criticisms on the written version of this on my site, so go and have a look at that. Uh, there's a really common point made about not having learning progressions for general capabilities. There's a lot of people out there saying that general capabilities, there's like you can't you can't teach creativity or critical thinking separately from their content. Uh, there's no generic skill called creative thinking that's um, separate from. You're like people can only think critically in a subject that they have a whole heap of domain knowledge about. That might be true. I don't think that's necessarily a point about learning progressions. That's a question about general capabilities at all. It's a separate debate. Uh, this is a great one. They are made up. Yes, they are made up, as is the curriculum. Uh, the point is that we can use empirical data to validate what we think learning looks like as it progresses. Uh, another point, implying learning is linear when it's not. Um, I'll accept that that's true to a certain extent. I don't think that any learning progression is going to perfectly describe uh, the order in which students learn for every single student. None other than Dylan William himself said that if it's 50, if, if your progression describes 50% of students or more, then that's great. And I think that we can get a lot higher than that. Most of the big data stuff that we've done in the schools I've worked at, we can. Uh, our hypothesized progressions are about 70 to 80 percent correct when we compare it to the data. Uh, they imply knowledge is hierarchical when it's not. That's a sep that's another separate debate. I um, I would say that when I write learning progressions for content knowledge, it's about use of content knowledge, not necessarily that some knowledge is a lot higher hierarchy than others. 
they can distort teaching. Uh, that's one of the weirdest criticisms because actually I think probably one of the biggest benefits of learning progressions is that they improve consistency of teaching both across a year level and both within a year level and across year level. Uh, so I actually think that they can hone teaching and target it a lot better. One common criticism is that progressions are badly written. I totally agree. It's the same point that I would make about most rubrics out there that haven't sort of been exposed to developmental ideas. Yes, many progressions are badly written, so write good ones. Um, another point is that oversimplify. Yep, that's true. So one response to that could be you can just write progressions that don't combine cognitive processes or accept the fact that a learning progression is a simplification of an extremely complex reality, which is learning. I don't think any proponents of learning progressions don't think that learning progressions are a simplification anyway, so no biggie. Um, and you can't reliably assess using progression. That's true to an extent. It really depends on how you choose to assess. I would say that using even a developmental rubric for to assess is only useful for complex performances. I would never want to see a test or short answer essay being assessed against a progression, but certainly having a progression in the background will allow you to provide students with questions and items of varying levels so a wider group of students have a chance to show what they can do. There's some references. That first one there is the Alonzo paper. I Referenced, I'd highly recommend you check that one out. That's probably the best thing on it. That one there. Uh, two of my, all of this stuff, the background, you know, the sort of the core philosophy behind this whole stuff is in Assessment for Teaching by Patrick Griffin with heaps of great co authored chapters by a bunch of legends. Two of my colleagues, one former and one current colleague, Tosh and Marsha, have written this thing here. And that shows you the example of how the Abel Swans project was developed using the processes in this book here, uh, fully data validated and being used very successfully across the state of Victoria and Australia. And that is about it. Thank you so much for listening. If you have any questions, if you want me to come and work with you, whatever, get in touch, ben at lawslearning.com. Keep it real.